So, my name is John Carvalho, CEO of Synonym, where we're trying to actually fix the world through a concept we call the atomic economy, and we're trying to include Bitcoin in this and trying to establish a free market society. As they mentioned, you know, it's supposed to be fix the money, fix the world. And that's often been expressed through this idea of hyper-Bitcoinization, which is some version of either denominating everything in Bitcoin or everybody paying for everything in Bitcoin or and or and or uh, Bitcoin being the only money that really matters in the world. But the idea was that that would bring a bunch of other benefits that fix the world. They would reduce the ability for the government to oppress us, for banks to capture us, for big tech to capture us, et cetera. But I don't think that we've actually expressed and seen that yet. And this hyper-Bitcoinization concept, I have a feeling is the wrong way of looking at how Bitcoin could play a role in fixing the world. We've had here some concepts that have happened throughout Bitcoin's history towards efforts for, you know, Bitcoin to scale and provide its capabilities to everybody. I'm going to go through them each really quickly. First is hyper-Bitcoinization or hyper-blockchainization could be another version for some of you. Um, but the issue is that if the idea is that Bitcoin is the only important thing and the reason why everything is getting fixed, well, how is that true if we have more monies than ever? There are more Bitcoins or more altcoins that were created immediately after Bitcoin. And I don't think it really shows that any trend where there's going to be less monies or somehow Bitcoin is going to totally win. We had a kind of a hyper tokenization where there was a phase where we were going to tokenize everything. And one really interesting thing was born out of that, stable coins. But stable coins are doing a much job, better job scaling peer to peer money than Bitcoin is. At least they're making more ground than we are. Hyper custodization. You have this concept where uh, people say that you can use banks to be able to scale Bitcoin, which there's obvious problems with that. Hyper treasurization, the latest trend, where we have uh, basically people using a substitute for Bitcoin in stocks. And then now, another very recent trend which is growing is this hyper layerization. This idea that by adding complexity and anchoring onto Bitcoin, that we could somehow scale it in order to provide it to everybody. I'm here to tell you, uh, well, I have good news and bad news. You know I like to start with the bad news if you know me at all, but we'll get to some good. I want to go into a little bit of detail how each, how each of those ideas are actually a trap. The token trap, tokens are censorable, right? They're centralized, they're, they can be inflated at will, which is not such a big deal when it's fiat, but if you try to use you know, Bitcoin as a token, you end up into these kind of problems. It doesn't work at scale. Uh, then we have this quote from Hal Finney, and I think Hal Finney is obviously a, a very important person in Bitcoin's history, Satoshi, etc. but I really wish he never made this quote. Um, says, I believe this will be the ultimate fate of Bitcoin to be the high-powered money that serves as reserve currency for banks that issue their own digital cash. The problem with this quote is that everybody uses this quote as evidence that this is what we're supposed to do, rather than just a prediction or an opinion. And it is just those things, and I highly disagree with it. Bitcoin by design just does not scale. Like The way that it works as a protocol, every single participant has to do the same amount of work. There's just a literal definition that it does not scale. We try to combat this idea with things like layers and all these concepts that we're talking about. But when it comes to banks, they're entirely antithetical to the purpose of Bitcoin. Like We know that Satoshi was inspired by banks to create Bitcoin to remove power from them, not as a means to give them something else to hold for us, right? So you can see how pretending that this is a way that Bitcoin is going to be successful and fix the world is a trap. The purpose of Bitcoin is obviously to hold it yourself. If you can't hold your own UTXO, what it's called, then you're not really a Bitcoin, you're not holding Bitcoin, you're just trusting somebody else. Uh, the treasury trap. I believe that Bitcoin stocks actually depress the price of Bitcoin. Uh, again, these are also centralized, censorable products. They're highly regulated, so they're already tightly integrated with governments. And in a way, they compete with the real Bitcoin on the market because for as long as people are willing to trust that these treasuries actually have the amount of Bitcoin they have, 
uh, that these exchanges actually have the amount of Bitcoin they're supposed to have. There's not going to be much of an expression of price difference if they inflate the amount of Bitcoin in custody and sell you Bitcoin they don't have. And inevitably that is going to express because they'll get hacked, there'll be a mistake, whatever it may be, it's centralized. And so it's, it's a very dangerous trap to pretend that somehow this trend of treasuries is actually advancing Bitcoin or Bitcoin adoption. Again, it's advancing treasury adoption. That's what stock adoption, that's all it's doing. Uh, and again, you can have this inflation of paper claims. Another related issue is that all of the people that are interested in methods that use derivatives or these treasury stocks, and they are all only interested in the price. They're not interested in the qualities of Bitcoin that actually make it valuable. They're interested in just waiting for the right price to sell it again. So they're not really contributing. It's a zero-sum sort of behavior where you know that those people are going to provide volatility, and that's all they're really going to do for Bitcoin. As I mentioned earlier, we have this trend with layers. Uh, we have now Lightning Network, Arc Protocol, Liquid, Spark, and there are more. Um, this is getting to maybe some of the more newer ideas and maybe controversial that I would like to talk about where layers don't scale Bitcoin either. The whole idea is a hypothesis that has not been proven. We can see that they can get these protocols to actually work and you know, go end to end and complete things but they can't provide any more scale than the base layer provides because what happens is whenever everybody needs to do some sort of behavior, they're all sharing the same block space in order to enforce the rules on that layer. So basically, when you need the layer the most in order as a, as a substitute for using base layer Bitcoin is when it's the most likely to fail you and be go into a trusted mode because all of the layers are actually trusted setups that have some sort of complex way of giving you a way to enforce that people can't steal from you anyway. They also bring regulatory risks. The designs of some of these, like sidechains, for example, could be censored with a phone call. You know, if, if you want to put a threat in from a government to the people working on whatever blockchain tech, whether it be liquid or anything else, they can influence them to change it and do it differently. It's too centralized. But you say, I, I already mentioned this part, you know, I can always settle my lightning on chain. You can settle on chain for now. This applies to all layers and they all compete for the same block space. So it's not the idea where you can have a new layer invention and that will somehow make things better and we can spread the load across them. No, the block space is shared by all of them. So as soon as any of them or all of them need to retreat on chain in order to enforce their rules, if the fees are too high, then what happens is if the value of your Bitcoin is lower than the fee, it's now trusted and pretty much owned by the counterparty. If you can't afford to enforce on chain. As I mentioned, there's also this complexity trap and this is something other people have already expressed and communicated and is known. A, there's this concept of the law of the conservation of complexity, which says that every application has an inherent amount of complexity that cannot be removed or hidden. Instead, it must be dealt with either in product development or user interaction. Basically, the complexity has to live somewhere. So when you attach all this stuff on top of Bitcoin and anchor it to it, there's going to be friction, cost, uh, delay, all these things that will cause people to want more efficiency and centralize. So the flow goes something like this. It's showing that whether it's a layer or a soft fork or any kind of construction, you end up adding the layer, adding the complexity, that leads to the centralization, that leads to an entirely trusted situation, and a choke point. Then the blocks get full, you can't exit, the exits are closed, your ability to enforce your rights in that transaction are gone, and the actual hub that you rely on is the provider for you. And you're now you're just in a trusted situation. I'm gonna get into some concepts now, and one of them to kind of build a foundation here is that everything looks the same at scale. It's a fractal concept, like for example, if you look at you know, the ground, you can't see all of the grains of you know, sand inside of the concrete or all of the little creatures crawling that are tiny. You just see the sidewalk for what it is. And everything looks that way in scale in such and expresses as a power law. So basically, the more people you want involved, the more people you want to coordinate into a system in order to accomplish a goal, the more centralization is going to be required, the more trust is going to be required to make it happen. This is sort of an example here where I've, where I've pointed out some different things that express this way. Uh, you have Linus Torvalds, you know, I'm joking a little bit, but not really. He's 
no, well known as a benevolent dictator, right? But he managed to, to provide something that many, many people rely on. A MasterCard, Visa, credit card, same thing. Coming down to even Bitcoin Core has a severe amount of decentralization. Now, I don't mean in the sense of the Bitcoin network, but this is a specific software project. And the way that it expresses is it only has a few maintainers at the top. All systems end up this way. You can, you can map the Bitcoin Core, you know, maintainers, developers, contributors to a closed source company that makes software, and you'll notice that the structure of them is similar. There's CEOs at the top, managers, middle managers, you know, there's a whole structure to it. You have LSPs, node runners, all the way down to running your own server on something like an Umbral. So what are we scaling exactly? Are we scaling Bitcoin? Are we scaling baking? Are we scaling complexity? No, I don't think we should, I think we should just entirely stop with all of this. What we need to be worrying about figuring out how to scale is trust. A lot of Bitcoiners like to imagine that there's this scale where you have Bitcoin on one end and banks on the other end, or trust, trustless and trusted, that it's somehow on the same scale. And I would say, if that's true, it would look something like this. It's more like you've got all the layers and all the trusted constructions all kind of close on the one far end of the scale, this huge gap where nothing is there, and then Bitcoin. And that's pretty much a binary situation, so I personally don't even know if this scale is a proper way to look at it. And so I just think you should think of Bitcoin is the closest we can get to trustless. Everything else is just some kind of credit with complexity combined with it. Of course, complexity leading to centralization and now trust requirements. So why would we scale trust? Well, because trust will always win. If you are trying to scale something or achieve you know, some massive societal impact, you need it. Society is trust. It's made out of it. You, and, I, and so what I'm trying to start suggesting here is we need to find ways to make that trust explicit, not just vibe-based. In other words, we all use these crude heuristics to make decisions about things like, oh, this person has a lot of followers, so they must know what they're talking about. This person's rich, so I should trust them. And these are kind of primitive ways of applying trust, but we need to apply it directly to the situations. Trust is required for both competition and cooperation. Like in the abstract, society is made out of people competing on various levels, whether it be in the economy or literally in sports, whatever it may be. You will see that when they cooperate, they can achieve a lot more together than the people who don't cooperate. And so the people who can't establish coordination, establish trust, they can't actually compete with the people that do. Complexity and trust cannot compete with trust alone. So now if you take these ideas and you think about a layer and you see it as complexity plus trust, and then you compare it to something that is just trust that does the same thing, the complexity plus trust is just never going to win because the user is always going to prefer it, the coordination and the trust is always going to be more collaborative and efficient. So you have to incorporate trust. <clears throat> trust must be contextual, quantifiable, and revocable. Again, explicit. We have to find ways to define it. So what do we do? How do we scale trust and freedom at the same time? In other words, now I'm going from saying, oh, Bitcoin, don't trust verify, to trust but, but verify. Well, is this like a total compromise of the Bitcoin ethos? I don't think so. I think it's just new understanding of how to approach the problem of this intention we have of the whole world being better because of Bitcoin and technologies like it. So how would we do this? Well, in our research involved in these areas, we've determined that there's explicitly four dimensions to trust when you're digitizing it. You have identity, context, and value, which is essentially like who you're trusting, with what, how much, for how long. So instead of hyper-Bitcoinization, I think the topic that should be spreading wildly across Bitcoin should be the concept of hyper-coordination, hyper-coordination. Just some way of explicitly defining trust and putting it in the user's hands. A way to give the scale of MasterCard without the capture of MasterCard. So this flow would look a little bit different. You're going from matching to alignment to coordination, which provides efficiency, and ideally, eventually, some form of harmony. And the reason why I mention this, which I won't get too much into, I don't have the time, is that I believe that Bitcoin doesn't fix government problems, that they will always be able to apply violence. And the only way you can mitigate violence is by providing alignment 
Give everybody some way to figure out what they agree on and connect on what they're actually trying to accomplish. So this way you can have this sort of dynamic alignment. So how do we scale payments with trust? We've, like I said, we've done a lot of research. We've implemented, I mean, I've been looking into credit and trusted aspects since before I started this company. Even at BitRefill, we wanted to do credit tokens or gift tokens instead of gift cards. We tried to implement RGB, we implemented Omni and Omnivolt, we reviewed CMYK, which became Taproot assets, we tried Greenlight, we are implementing Lightning right now with a self-custodial node in our, in our Bitcoin wallet, and no matter what, we just came down to that none of it actually scales. None of it is tolerable, tolerable by the user at all. You think about the idea of like now they want to do ARC feeding into Lightning, tied with Mint, and all these things, the complexity through all those layers is just unmanageable, in my opinion. Um, what's the solution? Credit. I use tabs. Some way of signing the credit between people so you have some established evidence in how to react to each other. We're calling the concept atomicity. I'm not launching or announcing anything today so much as that we are definitely researching this directly. We have a spec that we plan to show in the coming weeks, and basically showing how you could take all of these aspects, turn them into a protocol that users control and can figure out things like <clears throat> being able to, well, we have this nerd term here, credit evidence transport system for bounded risk payments. And so what we want to do is give them a way to express these details. You know, the key, the public key, as who? The ticker, like BTC USD, as what? the amount for how much, some sort of credit terms or terms for how long. Uh, you want people to be able to create these, reassign them, net them, essentially route them through dynamic paths of trust. Um, everything is contextual. The person is choosing their own context inside of it. What you're actually trying to do is establish reputation to achieve some sort of alignment, some sort of coordination. I'm not going to go into the whole detail of all of this today, but you see here that everything we've talked about or I've talked about in this presentation is only about and not about this circled area. This diagram is actually the whole plan of what we work on on Synonym, the concept of the atomic economy. Uh, if you want to learn more about the details of the rest of the plan and how it all works together, you can find videos of me explaining. You can go to our website, synonym.to, to kind of dig into it deeper. But again, we're just talking about the trust aspects today. If you're interested in learning more about how far we've gotten in progress so far, these are some of the products and projects that we've already created towards these goals. We have BitKit. Um, there's a booth you can go today and you know, get some free giveaways and install BitKit. It is a self-custodial Bitcoin and Lightning wallet. The Lightning node is inside of the wallet. We have this uh, protocol called P PKDNS which is basically a way of using a public key as a web domain. So instead of buying your domain from ICANN in a centralized, sensible way, you can actually, in an extremely decentralized way, much more than Bitcoin, be able to control a public domain that is a key that only you control. So you define where your server is, where your data is, you own your data. Then we have uh, the PubKey SDK, which is something that our team, our whole team is here in Lugano right now uh, testing and doing a hackathon with this SDK. So we'll launch that soon. This will make it extremely in easy for anyone to build with PubKey. PubKey is uh, PubKey app and PubKey core right now. The application is basically a web app that is a portal to this whole new ecosystem. The PubKey Core is a protocol that allows you to build with all of this in an open source way. And so the PubKey SDK is going to allow any of you to vibe code very easily anything that is within this ecosystem. That's all I have for today. Thank you.